Hey guys, and welcome to Anchor to Truth. Today we are diving into chapter 32 in the book of Jubilees. So let's get started. All right, guys, let's get started in verse 1 of 32. And it says, And he abode that night at Bethel, and Levi dreamed that they had ordained and made him the priest of the Most High Elohim, him and his sons forever. And he awoke from his sleep and blessed Yahuwah. And Jacob rose early in the morning on the 14th of this month, and he gave a tithe of all that he came with, both of men and cattle, and both of gold and every vessel and garment. Yea, he gave tithes of all. And in those days Rachel became pregnant with her son, Benjamin, and Jacob counted his sons from his upwards, and Levi fell to the portion of Yahuwah, and his father clothed him in the garments of the priesthood and filled his hands. And on the fifteenth of this month he brought to the altar fourteen oxen from amongst the cattle, and twenty-eight rams, and forty-nine sheep, and seven lambs, and twenty-one kids of the goats, as a burnt offering on the altar of sacrifice well-pleasing for a sweet savior before Yahuwah. This was his offering in consequence of the vow which he had vowed that he would give a tenth with their fruit offering, their drink offering, and when the fire had consumed it, he burnt incense on the fire over the fire, and for a thank offering, two oxen and four rams and four sheep and four he goats and two sheep of a year old and two kids of the goats, and thus he did daily for seven days, and he and all his sons and his men were eating this with joy there during seven days and blessing and thanking Yahuwah, who had delivered him out of all his tribulation and had, and had given him his vow. Okay, so what are we talking about here, guys? Well, right off the rip, Kyle, we got Levi having a dream that he's been ordained as the high priest. Okay. So that's that, that's very significant for the story. For sure, yeah, I, I agree with that point. I, and I know we had a similar story you know, throughout scripture with like joseph and all the brothers and the, the cat the wheat bowing down the sun moon and stars and all that kind of stuff it seems like god's never going god's not putting people in these large positions without any kind of preparation or any kind of setup mm -hmm. so he's like hey levi by the way i want you to know this is going to be confirmed and then double confirmed and then you're going to hear about it and it's still going to be chosen but you're going to be the one who's chosen and i, and I love that because it gives him a, like a little bit of a heads up of a all right let's Let's see how this plays out. Yeah. I mean, here's, you know, right off the rip, Kyle, the question you're asking is, you know, it's, it's making me think back to um, the Torah where it talks about at that time, you know, when Moshe goes up to the mountain, we know the whole story comes back down. Everyone's got the golden calf thing going on. Moses breaks the first tablet, has to have another set of tablets made, yada, yada. But during the midst of that, you know, we think this is when the or the ordination of the Levite priest came in to be. We think this is this is when God said, you know, everybody else messed up. So, but you boys did good. So now I'm gonna ordain you as the high priest. So we kind of have this whole thing wrapped around that because everybody else was being bad. <laughs> the guy's like, Well, I'm gonna pick you guys, but it's clear from this that they were picked way before. Way okay. before Mount Sinai, way before any events took place, they were picked way back when. Mm -hmm. Not only were they picked, but Levi knew. Right. <laughs> he knew he was going to be picked. Right. Uh. So let me ask this then. I, you know, I always want to kind of try to think outside the box and, and attempt to apply this to whatever we're reading, try to apply it to our lives today in the modern day and age, right? So we know that the Father do, does nothing without telling his prophets first. And I would even go as far as saying, and also the prophets telling the people what the Father has 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 in store. Is that something that we can apply to our lives? Not just the Father tells the prophets and then the prophets tell us. I'm referring to specific things that the Father calls us as individuals to do. Should we be expecting the Father or should we just say, okay, well, there's a lot of people that has, that claim to have a calling on their lives that clearly do not because they're because and the the reason I say that is because what they're teaching is false, mm -hmm. right? We see that a lot on YouTube. We see that a lot with televangelists, that sort of thing, right? So you get the idea of what I'm talking about. So clearly, there's a lot of people who claim to be called that are not called. But for those of us that are on the outside of that, is there something we should be waiting for? Not like a sign, you know, but how do we how do we walk that out? 
What do you guys think? Whether it be a dream or whatever. Well, I'll, I want to start off on by saying like I, I know we have some specific missions that are applicable to all people. Like <clears throat> we're called to be, we're called to occupy until he returns. So right. there, there's not a you know a weight out of complacency or a weight out of laziness or a weight even just out of lack of information. It's we're supposed to be on mission and focused on the gospel, on the Great Commission. A, a lot of the things that Scripture already tells us to do, being um, you know, if you're a man being the leader of your home or your, or yourself or whatever your scenario is and, you know, the family dynamic, there, there's a lot of things that are, we're already called to do that we're already expected to do as just children of God, uh, that these are already built in, baked into the scenario. But Kyle, to your point, there are some extra things, right? There's apostles and there's prophets and there's the, the guys who doing special things or even just um, you individual unique one-offs, right? So God's like, hey, I need you to do this. He didn't call Moses to go to Egypt 25 times. It was a one-time deal. And then right. when he was done with that, he was done with that. And, and there's a lot of stories in scripture, like the donkey talking with Balaam and Balak. That was, the donkey didn't just keep talking forever. You know, it was like the new pet friend, like Shrek. You know, this was a, <laughs> a one-time deal. He needed to one-time listen and then be one-time ready. Um, so mm-hmm. in those scenarios, yeah, we need to be super prepared to listen and put ourselves in the position. Like we've talked about prior with Abraham and other people of, be a friend of God. So when you have a need, you don't call a random neighbor 20 houses down. You call your friend. Hey, I need somebody to help me jump my car. Call your friend. Hey, I need somebody to pray with me. You call your friend. Hey, I need you to come with me to the hospital. You call your friend. You know, and God's like, hey, be one of my friends. And you know, I might call on you. I might tap you on the shoulder and be like, guess what? It's time to go. You set awesome. yourself up and you're ready for this. So, yeah, I definitely think there's two sides to it. But to your point, yeah, I don't think everybody's called for everything all the time, especially what we see in the world today. Awesome. Yeah. So I'll share my, my life experiences with you. <laughs> so for me, um, before I became a senior pastor of the vine, um, didn't get any visions, didn't get any whatever else. I just, you know, God's always spoken to me in my spirit. And I remember him saying, uh, I was in a, a, a time of preparation and that he would let me know, <clears throat> excuse me. He would let me know when that time would be. And so there was two other families we were walking with. And I remember telling them, Hey, God's called me to do this. If you guys, you know, you down for doing this with us. And they're like, yeah, just let us know when. And we literally, literally were walking through the halls, uh, the North Charleston, uh, performing arts center going to another church over there. And as I'm walking, I was kind of leading the way with everyone else. And I just felt my spirit. God said, it's time. He said, it's time. I said, okay. And I remember turning around and looking at the people behind me, the, the two other families going, you guys ready? God just told me it's time. Yeah, it's time. And it just started walking it out from there. So for me, it was a matter of being able to hear God's voice, being able to hear him when he spoke to me. And then I realized looking back over the course of my life, there were so many events that took place. So many times God had me pray. So many times something happened that God specifically told me at that time, you need to do this. And I thought it was just everyday normal life, you know, as a Christian. But what I realized is God was teaching me to hear his voice. Mm-hmm. He was teaching me to, when I call you, son, I need you to come. When I, you know, whatever it might be, when I tell you to pray for someone, and I've shared so many stories about when God's laid on my heart to pray for someone that, and then he always reveals to me, hey, this is what was going on. Mm-hmm. Um You know, so for me, again, it was about hearing the voice of God. Um and growing in that and that's why the vines here literally said hey you ready let's do it all right god i I literally said to him i don't know what i'm doing (laughs) (laughs) and so i and i literally and i've shared this before at my table that i have that if you guys watch this in our bible study the table that we sit at doing our bible study was the same table i sat at with just me and god i said what are we going to call it he said the vine and he said john 15 he said all these different things and me speaking to me what you know all this he just showed me and then that's what we did. You know, and the funny thing is you talk about um, kind of like when you're saying those who teach false gospels, maybe it's evident that God didn't call them. I wouldn't say that's always the case. What I would say is for whatever reason, um, maybe they just stop hearing because God called me out of Christian church. 100% Sunday keeping, pork eating, everything you name it i claimed it <laughs> i'll do that's the one time I'll, I'll say that phrase name it and claim it 
Uh, I was eating as unclean as you can get. I, I'm married to a Japanese woman, and you can imagine the things that we were eating <laughs> from squid to octopus to if it was if it came out the ocean, we were eating it. But God still called me. But the difference is, is when you hear the voice of God, and when He's taking you on that journey, it's just like with Abraham. Me and Jonathan had this discussion earlier today. We were talking. I said, you know what's funny? I said, God didn't have to give Abraham the whole story. All he said was, hey, son, it's time for you to leave her. Pack up your bags. Y'all need to roll out. And that was it. He didn't say, well, what's the plan, God? Where are we going, God? How are we, what are we going to do when we get there? How are we going to support ourselves? And God's like, hey, I told you to go. When you get there, build an altar. Make a sacrifice unto me. I'll speak to you. And from there, now you watch the journey of Abraham. was the same thing. Everywhere Abraham went, God was speaking to him. God was showing him. He was having dreams. He's having visions. You know, he's seeing all these different things because he was obedient to what God was calling him to do. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we literally started divine Sunday keeping in my basement. And then literally two months later, uh, we're in Torah. Awesome. But it's about hearing. It's like, you know, um, <laughs> that's one of the things about when you, when, we're, when God's called you for a purpose, don't shut it off. Don't, um, you, you always got to be listening and hearing what the father is saying to you. And when he's leading you in these things, because unfortunately we've had this discussion off camera a little bit, we get to a point in our walk where there's Torah, Messianic, whatever you want to call it, Christianity, we can all get to a place of complacency where it's like, well, doing the best I can. We'll just wait for Jesus to get back. And we just kind of like, just, you know, this is it. We're going to pull our boat over to the side and then we're going to park it. And that's going to be it till he shows up. Mm -hmm. But here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen, for everyone watching us, the spirit of God is always moving. The spirit of God is always speaking. The spirit of God is always active. And if we're, if we desire to be a part of that, then we will hear, we will react. We will go, we will do, we will see things that we've never seen before. And when I came into this wall, the first thing I said to God was, if you call me, all right, I'm making sure you call me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, and I literally said, the first thing I said when he says it's time, I said, if you call me, I want to know your ways and not man's. And all I heard at that moment was, you got it, son. And little did I know <laughs> what I was getting into. <laughs> but I'm blessed by it. I'm blessed to be here with you guys. I'm blessed to be uh, on Anchor to Truth, to be the pastor of the vine. All this is a blessing. And all you guys who join us every week, you're a huge part of that blessing as well. Amen. And so anyway, I just want to encourage you that don't stop listening. Don't stop growing and be spirit led. I thought you were going to awesome. go into song. Don't stop, don't believing. stop believing. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> I could if you want me to. I can't um, make it like Perry, but you know. <laughs> but yeah, Joe, to your point, just to add really quick, I wanted to read a verse for you guys. It's out of John chapter 10. I know you mentioned John 15 for the vine name, but in John chapter 10, it says, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And to your point, you're talking about hearing, you know, the ability to stop everything you're doing and say, God's talking to me. Hey, God's mm -hmm. moving in my life right now. It's time to make a change and adjustment. It's time to yep. hear what he's saying and act on it. And it says the only people that are going to know his voice are his sheep. So, you know, are, are we counted amongst his sheep? Are, are we going to be in the position where he says he gives them eternal life? It sounds like a kind of an exclusive club. This isn't a throw right. throw all the seed out and everybody gets to get some. It's a, no, only these sheep know my voice and only these sheep get eternal life. And he's like, these ones, you're not going to pluck them out of my hand. So, yeah, Joe, I love that point that you made about really, truly hearing, really, truly listening to God mm -hmm. and letting that be our our marching orders and nothing and nothing else. So out of what you guys were saying, well, first of all, I agree with it, but um, <laughs> what, what I'm getting out of that is be the kind of person that, that God calls a friend, be a friend to God. Yeah. So you're the kind of person that he will call on. Mm -hmm. And when he calls on you do it and don't be afraid of not knowing how, because if it's a mission that God has us on, I don't care how much skill we have. We're not going to know how to do what it is that he wants us to do. We have to trust and obey, right? Be obedient in that. Mm -hmm. And he'll, he'll make the path for us. So that's what I get out of that. But also kind of when you were talking about the, uh, the false teachers, how they might've lost the way. I've also heard it said, and I'm, I would say that I would probably agree with this a lot that these individuals are a type of judgment on those that do not seek truth. They're the ones with itching ears. 
that they're a type of, uh, of judgment for those individuals. So yeah, come out of her, mm -hmm. so be the kind of individual that he calls a friend that he will call on you. And, uh, and then when he calls go, right, go and do anyway, I know it's kind of different from what this passage is talking about, but I, I did see that as an important thing that we probably, that we could address from that. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I think Kyle, to your point there about like, you know, us kind of addressing something askew to the passage. I, I mean, re in reality, it's exactly in line though. You know, it, like when we're reading verse one there, it talks about uh, they stayed the night at Bethel. Well, what happened the last time they stayed the night at Bethel? Mr. Jacob had himself a cool little dream. Got to see a ladder, got to see, God Almighty or Yeshua, an angel, somebody standing at the top of the ladder, right? And all the angels are descending up and down. He's like, oh, man, this is really cool. I just found out something special. And then now Levi, same place, same reason, having another dream. And it's like, oh, this is interesting because now we're seeing this play out multiple times. And God's like, when I want to talk to you and when I want to show you something, I'm going to show it to you. But I thought the location was specific because, you know, could, could he have done this any time at any place for any reason? Sure. But he's like, oh, at Bethel, though, now, th this is the place that I'm going to talk to dad and I'm going to talk to son. And it's going to be very, very important time. Like th these are things that are, you know, Bible altering historical moments. From this point forward, Levi has the priesthood. From this point forward, Jacob is the only one who got to see the ladder. You know what I mean? That was a, hey, by the way, you're Israel now. Hey, by the way. Hey, by the way. And so I think it's really important for us to see one Levi being selected, if we want to call it that, and, and being put in that position. And we get the same reference out of, I think it's the Testament of Levi, uh, chapter eight, somewhere in there. Um, but it talks about the same thing of like when he was called, way, like Joe said, way prior to Moses, and Moses wasn't even thought of yet. And we already have this whole priesthood set up and it's given us very specific dates and on the 14th of the month and on this, on that. So, you know, it definitely wanted us to know the angel of presence who was talking to Moses was like, by the way, this was important enough for me to give you time, date, place, and event. So, mm -hmm. if, you know, if for us reading it, you know, that's key in a little bit, you know, you're getting a little bit of extra details. Maybe this is important. Maybe this will defeat mm -hmm. some arguments that you're going to have with, other brothers and sisters and other communities that are thinking something contrary to this statement. Absolutely, brother. So a couple of neat little side notes here. Let me bring this up. So the, the notes on the side here, I'm just going to read them, take them for what they are. <laughs> but anyway, the, 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 the notes in this that we're reading out of, it says, um, Testament of Levi eight, which describes Levi's dream slash vision of seven men in white, as having taken place at Bethel, also five of the same work uh, in 9.3. Jacob has this dream also. Down below that it says, Hasmonean priest kings were not Levites, nor even Israelites, but Samaritans. They usurped this title from the Levites, whom they ousted from the high priesthood. There is no biblical justification for such. Mm. Um, right? Yep. Down below that, Levi, as the tenth son, counting backwards from Benjamin, fell under the law of tithe to the Lord and was consecrated to the priesthood. Leviticus twenty-seven thirty-two. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the last thing down here says a technical expression meaning appointment to the priesthood. And what was that referring to? Uh, I might be referring to the the portion the Levi fell to the portion of oh, Yahuwah. There you mm -hmm. go. There you go. Yeah, because then but, it makes it not, not random. It's not by chance. It wasn't by luck of right. the draw. He's like, he literally counted 10. It was like, you. So, Well, you yeah. remember, too, the, the in um, I think it's in Leviticus, it talks about the tithing. Mm -hmm. um, it says when you put the rod out. Right. And whatever passes under the rod, it, it, it's unto Yahuwah. Even if it's your prize bull, even if it's your prize sheep, whatever it might be, it's your favorite. God says when you put the rod out and it passes under it, don't take it back. Mm -hmm. You know, Jacob fully understanding here the principle of tithing. And unfortunately, we live in a time where prosperity gospel is completely destroyed. <laughs> Anybody's faith in the church system, to, you know, as far as it comes to money, they will keep they will keep that commandment all day long, <laughs> but throw the rest of them out. Oh no, well, you know, all of them are done. Oh, but he didn't do away with the tithing, though. Don't don't stop that. <laughs> keep the money flow. But you understand that there's more to the tithe than just, it's, it's not about getting back. It's about giving, actually. Yeah. 
the getting back is so that you can give more back. Because this, this is all about God's system here. This is all about everyone gets to eat. Everyone gets a place to, to sleep. Everyone gets a place, you know, everyone's taken care of. Shoes on your feet, all that stuff. When we do what's proper. Mm -hmm. Does God bless the tithe? Absolutely. If it is a proper tithe given to him, he blesses it. And Jonathan, we had this conversation earlier too about, you know, hey, I, I was in my firm belief that when he said, hey, give the gleanings of the field to the sojourners and the widows and the orphans and anyone who's in need of food. Why? Because guess what? The more that you give away next year, your car, your crop's going to be like coming in like crazy. People going to be like, I said, this, this is the one time when you can really use that bless, bless and highly favored. <laughs> Right. You're like, man, your core is 20 feet tall. Bless and highly favored, brother. Because <laughs> now I can give away more to those who are in need. Right. It wasn't about putting it in my storehouse, you know, all of it was about or, ma or ma making more bank. It was about, hey, who can I feed? Who's in need? Mm -hmm. How many people we know that have gardens that, that literally go, man, my garden gave out so much this year. Can you, anybody who wants to squash tomatoes? I mean, they're just giving it away, right? Yep. And that's what this is, you know, part of that tithe is literally to give it away. And other parts of that tithe that we're getting ready to read here in a little bit was for the enjoyment as well. So mm -hmm. we'll leave that for when we get to that part. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, side side tangent here. Um, you brought up the part about the, the rod, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know. Sometimes I just have thoughts pop in my head and I got to, I got to express it. Um, so it, the, the thought popped in my head, spare the rod, spoil the child. I was and thinking my, that too. And my head kind of went down this little rabbit trail here. It's like, well, what else spoils? Fruit spoils. Mm -hmm. Okay. That means it has gone bad. The verse is Proverbs 13, 24. It says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, mm -hmm. but he that loveth him chasteneth him. Be times whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. So, so that's two different versions. I had the, the King James version and also uh, the NIV there. <clears throat> well, chasten is the, the word for that is discipline. Well, mm -hmm. discipline yeah. can, can mean a form of, of like punishment or whatever, but it's a correction is what that is. Discipline mm -hmm. is, is to correct. Where was that out again, Kyle? Proverbs 13, 24, but we can also be disciplined in our actions of so the things right. that we do. Right. So it, it's, it's a, it's a type of dedication, if you will, mm -hmm. a specific focus or dedication to something to be disciplined in something. So I don't know, it just, it, I, I bringing all that together. It's if you spare the rod, if you don't use the rod to do and be disciplined with the rod to give the portion, yes, you have, plenty of stuff you're going to spoil spoil your child and he's going to produce bad fruit mm, anyway like okay it. so you know what I'm, you're saying as long as i only have nine kids i'm good <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure we'll run with that <laughs> anyway was that enough of a rabbit trail for you yeah I was, just look, I was looking at that myself <laughs> i pulled out the septuagint on that one what's interesting though kyle when you go back and look at that is it's talking about wealth right before it it says a good man will, in verse 22, it says a good man will inherit grandchildren, but the wealth of the ungodly is stored up for the uh, righteous. The righteous will spend many years in wealth, but the unrighteous will be destroyed suddenly. Then it goes into whoever restrains the staff hates his son, that mm -hmm. the one who loves disciplines, or the one who loves disciplines carefully. A righteous person satisfies his soul when he eats, but the soul of the ungodly are in want. That's good, man. God is so good. <laughs> well, and the other aspect of that is if you're if you're not doing it appropriately, then what are your what is your child learning? You know, what, what example do they have is, oh, dad's not doing it. I'm not going to do it. Oh, right. so we don't we can we can keep all 100 percent. Sweet. This, this is a good deal. 100 percent goes a lot further than 90 percent in the world's economy and God's economy. 90 percent goes 100,000 percent because he's like, oh, mm -hmm. I'll just give you what you need every single time. Oh, you need a pay right. raise. You need a you need a promotion. Somehow mm -hmm. you're going to get it. No one else is surprised. I was looking out for you or even without any money attached to it. You just have a better life or you just have a more fruitful experience while you're living. Mm -hmm. you, you're reading the Bible and stuff pops out at you and you do the cow face. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, man. That's good. I, um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of thinking that maybe we have been, uh, 
there's there's so much depth to y'all's word, man. There really is. We've been looking at surface level stuff for so long. Mm-hmm. And golly, it's just that's just so awesome to me. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, so we're, we're talking about all the tithes, and I know like there in verse five, it talks about all these different tithes. You know, sometimes we just get so caught up in money. You know, like our, our today world is just mm-hmm. money. And I think, you know, this this is a little bit of a side trail, but I'm gonna jump right back on real quick. You know, if we if we were to live kind of like how God designed humans to live, it's not to go to the grocery store, it's not to be in the in the doctor in the pharmacy every day. You know, a lot of that stuff right. that we, we have built into our world isn't really a part of the original design. So we're we're missing out on a little bit of what this is talking about. You know, we we take our money because it's an exchange for goods. So essentially we are earning what we would normally earn in goods, but we get it in money and then transfer it. But what, what that does is that forces us to not really have a tangible first fruits. It just says, well, whatever you produce, well, all we're producing now is numbers on a screen and a, on a credit card, you know, numbers on a screen in a bank that could turn technically into zero, but not to fear you guys, you know, that's what we have exactly right now is just the system of numbers on computers. And I, I still, like Joe said, I still appreciate the, the concept of tithing and the application of it because, you know, it's something God designed, something he built into the system from what, day one? So yeah. you know, something, it's something that's clearly important all the way through the scriptures. And, and here, you know, I love whenever we get to read, it says he gave a tenth of their fruit and their drink and the this and the that. Mm-hmm. And so they're like, hey, everything that we have, every little bit of stuff, I have to give some of that back and show appreciation for it. You know, it's kind of like, when, when somebody does you a solid and you, you give you, you slide them a 20, you know, you're like, Hey, by the way, I really appreciate it. Here's a little bit of money. I know you didn't ask mm-hmm. for anything. I know you didn't, you, this wasn't a part of our contractual agreement, but I appreciate you, man. This, you saved my butt on this one, but, and I'm not saying that God ever needs our money or, or our goods or our produce or whatever, but he wants to see that heart, right? Yeshua came to the earth and gave it all. And he's just asking us to give a little bit to, sh- to show a little bit, to walk like his son who was giving it all. And he said, Hey, I don't need you to be Jesus, Yeshua, but I need you to be working on it. 10% is your minimum. That's mm-hmm. your start. Everything after that's offering and everything's after that is praise and gifts and, and taking care of people. But he's like, start with this basic principle. And I think that helps us to be in line with the father in line with the son way more than we think. And it's mm-hmm. not just a monetary thing. It's a, he's constantly giving to us. He's given us a spirit, he's given up his son. And we're like, nah, I need these $22. And he's like, well, come on. I mean, are you, are you really thinking about me when you when you talk like that? Are you really considering the kingdom whenever you you move your financials that direction? So it's it's an interesting concept, but I love here that it's like no questions. They knew about it, they were ready for it. He didn't he didn't have any sour face at the end of it. He was like he it, it was glad. You know, it even says it was a thank off. Well, do you think that this is guys? Do y'all think that this is a um, a specific? I mean, I, clearly we have a specific uh day of a specific month is there any significance to this of something that we should be keeping now well i know we talked um in our last video about this being potentially around the fall feast time that whenever they left out of bethel it was a very much a um springtime feast so if this is in in any way near our fall feast you know that's whenever you during sukkot time especially or feast of booze and tabernacles that's where you would go and give all your produce Mm -hmm. for the year your first fruits of everything so to see the kind of things that they're bringing this isn't just oil this isn't just wine this isn't just lamb this is everything apparently so i i I was speculating in the back of my head that we might be looking at a a fall feast um fall feast day well there's definitely the feast of tabernacles is what what what's happening here Okay. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. I wish I was smart enough to know that. <laughs> well, my, my page tells me that it is, so that's how smart I am. <laughs> <laughs> Trying not well, to cheat over here. I guess yeah. I, I guess what I was going to get into was this, is uh, if this is a biblical feast, which I, I go along with that, that it is as well, um, how often do we I – guess, I guess I'm curious, you guys in the comments – is this something that we apply during the Feast of Sukkot? You know, Sukkot is, uh, or Tabernacles, whatever you want to call it, right? This is this is a time where everybody gets together and goes out camping and feasts and all this stuff going on. But this says, thanking Yahuwah, who had delivered him out of all his tribulation and had given him his vow. Is that something that we do? Maybe that should be a practice we should be doing. I mean, obviously, we should be doing that all the time. But it seems to me like this is a time for that specifically. What do you guys think? 
So, so Kyle, what I'm what I'm thinking here, and what I, what I'm hearing, if this is Tabernacles, Booze, Sukkot, is this is the celebration of the end of the biblical feast year. This is you just finished with trumpets, with hey, be ready, be prepared. Mm -hmm. Then you have atonement. So you you know when you when you read the word there about um the the vow and him and him coming pretty much coming through for him. Well, yeah, you just had atonement. You just got to reset your whole life from that mm -hmm. year. Everything yep. from that year just got the big reset button. Now, by no means am I saying that you can just go on and start sinning again because you got next year to you know reset it. But <laughs> you know, that's a time when God's really dealing with the human and the human's dealing with God and they're saying, hey, you know, now we're going to be in a, in a better position. Let's go do tabernacles. Let's go celebrate together. So I love that you brought that up. And at the same time, you know, but the challenge there is, are we truly going there with the expectation of giving or are we going there with the expectation of self? You know, so often uh, we have yeah. Sukkot is like, how do I get the best Sukkot? How do I get the best fire and eat the biggest steaks? And then, you know, like, well, what did what did you go there to take care of somebody? You know, we've had feedbacks from groups all over the world. So I don't single anybody out of, well, I didn't I, I didn't save any money this year. Well, Sukkot cost too much. Well, I had to pay for this. Well, I had to pay for that. You know, th well, things and he's like, well, where's your focus at? You know, if you have to sleep in a tent that year, you have to sleep in a tent. But the focus is to give, you know, to make sure that you're bringing your first fruits from the year, that you're taking care of the poor, the widows and have so much extra that you yeah. leave it there. You don't take it home with you. You don't have a cooler full of stuff and said, hey, surprise, look at all these blessings that I have. We use the word I a few too many times and maybe it needs to be give and for someone else. Yeah, That's absolutely, it. man. You know, I think it's it's a it's a both. God wants us to go there and he's, and we're actually commanded to have a good time. Exactly. So he wants to have a good time. But the reason why you can have a good time is when you're following his ways, you're putting aside what you need. Cause here's the thing. You, if you've been in this walk for a minute, this happens every year. This you know, should never sneak up on you. It should never be like, Oh, we got a month out from us a code. I don't have any preparations. No, nothing. <laughs> this is, this is why with God's system of tithing and putting things away, where by the time you get to, this is, it was actually three tithes spoken of in the word. One is the, you know, the, the 10th, the tithe that you give to the tabernacle. Then you have the second tithe uh, is uh, for your feast days. And then the third tithe is what you give to the widows and orphans every three years. Take an accumulation of that and you give it back to the people. And even at Sukkot, he's like, hey, uh, if, you, if you got to, if I bless you so much and you can't take it all, like it's a big caravan, it's too far sell it all, make some coin off of it. When you get there, buy the provisions you need. But when you're done and you say, wow, look, I have a lot of this leftover. Go to the Levite who will take care of the widows and the orphans and all this other stuff. Go and give it to them so that they can, you know, be fed and everything else. And guess what? Everyone's good. Mm -hmm. Every, all the way across, everyone's good. I just had an idea though. I want to share. So Yom Turo going into Yom Kippur. That's usually that time where, you know, traditionally we try to make things right. Right. And you go to you say, hey, Kyle, if I've made you angry this year, then, you know, mm -hmm. we should have handled it before this. But can we, you know, go ahead and take care of this now? Right. Right. And Kyle's <laughs> so you like, make amends. Mm. What, did Jacob, <laughs> what did Jacob just do with Laban before he came this way? Exactly. Mm -hmm. He made amends. Yep. And that's why when we were reading it, it was so in my brain kept thinking this was important. God did not want you leaving this situation, burning bridges and bad more bad family stuff by the way we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna forgive each other we're gonna hug it out a little bit and by the way you don't cross my border i won't cross yours <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we're gonna leave on a good note and that's why i believe that there was that blessing when he got home and he sees his dad his mom hey these are my boys you know all this stuff's going on it's just a great and you're reading the story this is a great time Mm -hmm. He wasn't begrudgingly given his tenth either. We're like, oh man, I made a vow and I got a. <laughs> He's like, no. He's like, hey, I made a vow and I'm going to keep that vow because God has blessed me so much. Right. Amen. You know. Yeah, and, so, and and Joe, small point to that is just you were just saying, you know, making sure every, you, the Sukkot, the tabernacle is a time to go have a good time. It's commanded yeah. to go go have a good time. Well, guess what? Some people. Are unable to have a good time because their lack or their need so that is why it's built in hey you go make sure that you have a good time and then you go make sure somebody else has a good time it's kind of like yep. the potluck principle bring enough food for you and somebody yep. else it's just we, we do it today it's built in we, we don't yep. call it a tithe but if you do a potluck you have tithed a little bit you brought some for you and some for somebody else that's yep. what right. this is talking about so everybody can have a good time somebody's yep. going to show up that's a single guy or 
you know, some of them got no money and they're like, hey, mm-hmm. is something I can eat? Hey, yeah, we all borrow a little we've, extra. We've, we've done it in the past with Sukkot where someone's like, man, I don't have a campsite. I'm like, well, you can camp right here. Camp yep. in our campsite, whatever. Right. Hey, we've had people that literally showed up and uh, literally camped out of their pickup truck with a tent one year. Mm-hmm. And that was like the worst rain we've ever gotten during the Sukkot. <laughs> and I felt for them. But I was like, man, what troopers? Mm-hmm. But we made sure they're taken care of. We made sure hey, you got your, you got food, you got whatever you need. You let us know. Matter of fact, we set up another tent on the other side of our tent of Eden. Said, hey, if you need a dry place to go to, hey, yep. stay in there. So right. we even set, we even set up another extra tent just for anybody that showed up or there was a need. And I think that's that's that mentality we should have going into. It. Like you said, Jonathan, it's not just about us. Guys, like, why don't you think about your fellow man, mm-hmm. fellow woman? You know, take care of them too, so we can all enjoy this this time together. Well, in the kingdom, nothing is about us. It, 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 it's, I think it can be summed up right here. On the side, it says, Testament of Levi 9.3, And Jacob paid tithes of all to the Lord through me, referring to Levi. Mm-hmm. Right. It doesn't say to me. It says mm-hmm. through me. Right? And that's the way we are supposed to be. Amen. Amen. And uh, one last little thing before we get into the, um, before we start reading 9 or eight, uh, is I'm, a, uh, it's, it's my under, it's my understanding. We, we get in these habits, right? We, we, we celebrate a feast day and then we have a space between where it's okay. Back to the normal life. And then we have a feast day and then it's back to the normal life. And then we have a feast day, right? It's not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be, we have a time period of preparation before our first feast. And then from that feast on, we are in preparation to the next. Mm -hmm. And from that one to the preparation for the next, we are always to be minded of those things. Uh, Yes. It's it's always supposed to be in the forefront of our mind. It is what our focus to the next thing is so that we can do kingdom duties. Mm -hmm. So that we will be prepared for when Sukkot comes around. He gives us the whole year to get ready for that. Mm -hmm. Right? So anyway. Yeah, I just want to bring up there in uh, verse seven, guys, um, about this. This is this is the part of the the feast that they're celebrating and how they're they're doing this with joy in their heart. It says, and he he and he and all his sons and his men were eating this with joy there during seven days and blessing and thanking Yahuwah, who had delivered him out of all his tribulation and had given him his vow. They were eating with joy. Mm-hmm. You know, God's like, hey, you get to this point. Uh, by the way, part is tithe you're giving. You get to make a big barbecue out of it, by the way. <laughs> and you get to enjoy this. I mean, I'm telling you, I, every time I see these passages, I think of, of, of my my smoker outside. I think of my grill. I think of all I think of all the smells, especially the smoker. The smoker's like, man, you just walk outside, it's it's done taking over the entire property. It's like, oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're already wanting to eat, and the meat's still raw. You're like, I want to eat it now, <laughs> right? <laughs> Could you imagine the the cookout they're having here, and the and the smell and the uh, aromas and everything that's going on? Mm. Uh, oh, man, enjoy it, son. My, my my wife, my <laughs> wife really does not like it. But if I'm speaking to somebody and I'm comparing, uh, I'm talking about the biblical feast, and you know, when somebody asks me, well, why do you do that stuff? I'm like, man, are you serious? What do you mean? Why do I do this? <laughs> God's system is way better better than our man made system. I mean, like, what, what what do we have? We have Christmas, Easter, uh, Valentine's Day, you know, and you name a few of them off. And I'm like, even if you throw in the weird holidays, like <laughs> the off the wall ones, you know, you count those, you still only left with just these few, and it's one day events, nothing to it. Da, da, da. I was like, but dude, look at the biblical feasts. God wants us to party. Like, you know, this one's, you know, eight days, you know, and da 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 And and Eve, she despises that I said that God <laughs> wants us to party, you know, but. <laughs> but Maybe it, not the best that. connotation. <laughs> right, right, right. But, yeah. I mean, it's a but, celebration, you right. know. Well, and party is not a bad word. You know, we've we've turned it into a, a negative because of the <laughs> culture. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, honestly, you're, you're, you're seven days. You're having a good time. You know, where, where what, what are you talking about? This is joyful. You're having a good time. You're enjoying family, friends. You're eating good. You know, and this goes back to all the way, you know, we were reading about Abraham. He's 
building the altar and I don't know, he was walking around or dancing around the altar seven times each day. You know, he's like, he, he was, he's, I'm setting up, this is, I'm having a good time. I don't right. know about you guys, but God told me to do it. I don't understand it all yet, but I bet you I'm going to practice it and we're all going to enjoy it. And it, it was such a good time, apparently, that it has transferred all the way till now to caught on yeah. to, uh, <laughs> you know, Jacob here and, and his family and all the way to 2020, whatever year you're watching this. So, you know, it's still <laughs> happening. This, this was clearly a good time. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, well, let's have a good time in this next one. Go, go ahead and get it going, Joe. All right, let's jump on verse eight. And it says, and he tithed all the clean animals and made a burnt sacrifice, but the unclean animals he gave not to Levi, his son, and he gave him all the souls of the men. And Levi discharged the priestly office at Bethel before Jacob, his father, in preference to his 10 brothers. And he was a priest there and Jacob uh, gave his vow. Thus he tithed again the tithe to Yahuwah and sanctified it and it became holy unto him. And for this reason, it is ordained on the heavenly tables as a law for the tithing again, the tithe to, tithe to eat before Yahuwah from year to year in the place where, he, where it is chosen that his name should dwell. And to this law, there is no limit of days forever. This ordinance is written uh, that it may be fulfilled from year to year and eating the second tithe before Yahuwah in the place where he hath, where he hath been chosen and nothing shall remain over from it from this year to the following or to the year following. For in it, its year shall the seed be eaten till the days of the gathering of the seed of the year and the wine till the days of the wine and the oil till the days of its season. And all that is left thereof and becometh old, let it be regarded as polluted. Let it be burnt with fire for it is unclean and thus let them eat it together in the sanctuary and let them not suffer it to become old. And all the tithes of the oxen and sheep shall be holy unto Yahuwah, and shall belong to, uh, to his priests, which they will eat before him for year to year. For thus it is ordained and engraven regarding the tithe on the heavenly tables. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to pause there. Yeah. <laughs> all right, good deal. Okay. What you got in this one, boys? I'm, I'm curious about eight. Mm. Yeah. Because uh, we never really hear anything about the unclean animals, but it's like he tithed all the clean animals and made a burnt sacrifice. But the unclean am clean animals he gave not to Levi, his son, and he gave him all the souls of the men. I, mean, I wonder if it's just a formality of them just saying, and by the way, there's no unclean animals being sacrificed at all. There was no tenth of the unclean animals, you know, given as food. That's all yeah, I, think, I can think of it is. I don't, I don't understand why they're even bringing up the, the unclean animals. I think there's a, a dual nature there. I think if, it clearly is telling you the unclean wasn't on the altar. The unclean wasn't being eaten. It's like it's making right. that distinction very clear. But it's also saying that there was no exclusion to the tithe. If you had donkeys, if you had horses, if you had camels, if you had... Donkey! <laughs> Sorry, I had, I had to do it. <laughs> I, I appreciate it, too. <laughs> It's my swamp. So if you have a lot of, you know, unclean animals, but they're still useful, they're still they're still a part of the the whole uh, wealth of the nation. Right. Uh -huh. you, you, so it's saying I'm still tithing on them. We're just not doing no food stuff or any kind of sacrifice stuff. But, yeah, if you if I have 100 donkeys, you get 10 of them. And that's just how it's going to work. And now you yeah. have 10 donkeys and now you can use the 10 donkeys. But. The Levites, they don't need that. Give it to somebody else. Like that, that'll right. go, that'll get used in other way appropriately. And, and they would they would have known that it wouldn't have been a surprise to them. Like, oh no, what do we do with these 10 donkeys? Give them to somebody else. But thank you for giving it because that was the right thing to do, and we all right. win. Right. So yeah, the, the donkeys and things like that that are unclean, they are useful. They're beasts of burden, mm -hmm. right? They carry heavy right. loads, they do all the things, right? So uh, now I would I would go as far as saying you know when we have uh, when we have tabernacle and all that kind of good stuff moving around there's gonna need to be some moving around of some heavy stuff right mm -hmm. so so maybe but I would say that they probably I, I don't know if they were in charge of tending to the animals the unclean animals I, I don't know how that would work specifically I don't know if anyone does well, please let us know you talking about the Levites Kyle yeah I mean well, I know they were in charge of the taking care of all the sacrificing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, before. I would say probably not. I mean, I wouldn't think there would be, I mean, they don't, they don't have a tabernacle yet, of course, here. 
like they do in the wilderness, but I don't think I think if they're if they're in a set apart place, so to speak, they wouldn't have unclean animals within that area. That's just my guess. But I agree. And they could have used the oxen. They could have used all the cows and oxen and stuff, which are done. even better at doing that job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um don't, don't discriminate. <laughs> don't hate. <laughs> definitely better at carrying the heavy loads. Um, but then again, that still brings up the question who is the ones that's taking care of these oxen, that sort of thing, right? So mm, right. Uh, is this something that was lent to them when everybody is moving or or what? You know, I would assume they're gonna make use of what's available. Yeah. But right. um, well, well, like I said, uh as far as the tavern later down the road, we have the tabernacle, you're not gonna have animal defecation you're not going to have any of this stuff within the tabernacle so i'm assuming obviously yes if if, if part of the levitical priesthood was to take care of the animals that were given to them and that would be outside somewhere in the proper place right mm -hmm. or what we usually see is during all these sacrifices the people are bringing their meat portion for you and your family a portion for the levite so everyone you know what i mean as they bring the meat it's slaughtered they, they clean it they Matter of fact, the dung, while they're doing that, we know that the dung, the entrails, all that stuff gets, you know, just, there's separate things done with all of that. So right. so everything stays clean. You don't want to go but, into detail, Joe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, have a, we'll have a visual aid later. <laughs> <laughs> but this whole chapter, guys, is talking about, this is when I said there's three tithes. This is talking about the second tithe here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is the tithe you get to eat, you know? And then, and then there's some stipulations on it. Hey, by the way, here's your second, the second tithe of this is what you're bringing out of your, you know, storehouse, so to speak, or out of your produce. And you're going to eat it, have a great time, but it sounds very similar to the Pesach. Don't leave it. Don't let it get old. Don't let stale meat be hanging around, you know, with maggots in it. <laughs> if you don't finish it, you know, burn it, get rid of it. Right. Before the, we get... Go ahead, sorry. I was going to say, keep the uh, camp campgrounds clean. <laughs> there you go. Right. Before we get too far down down the, the passages here, I want mm -hmm. to bring this up in verse 8 at the end. It says, and he gave him all the souls of the men. Mm -hmm. This is really cool, and we don't need to miss this. When we think of a, there's a role of a pastor and there's a role of a preacher. Right? Mm -hmm. Preacher preaches pastor takes on the responsibility of the souls of those individuals mm -hmm. yep. right and so that that's what is happening here is he's as this high priest he's the one responsible for the souls of the men i think that's really really cool he gave him all the souls of the men mm -hmm. so this is a, a a passing on of that this is now your responsibility yeah that's really really cool well and and kyle one of the you know i would it didn't seem like it fit at first, but you know, when you, when you look at a flight manifest, you look at a pilot on a plane, it says, you know, well, how many souls are on board? You know why? Because that pilot is in charge of all those people's actual souls. That's and right. If that plane goes at crunch, then the pilot was the one who literally goes down with the ship. Cause well, you know, you're, you can't get out of that one. But you know, it's interesting to see, even in our modern world, we still use terms like that of like, Hey, whenever you get on board, on board, you're transferring those people to the pilot. And when you get off, then they transfer their ownership of their soul back to themselves. It's just an uh, interesting thought yeah. how we just flippantly say stuff like that. And we actually start to think about it. You're like, Oh yeah, that's kind of how that works. Yep. Yeah. You know, you're in trouble when you, you know, whether it's a ship or a plane, if you got the uh, captain of the ship or the captain pilot of a plane and you see them getting off the plane while it's still going, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if the pilot gets off of the plane, we're we, in the mid flight. We right. have issues. Yeah. Hey guys, it's been a great flight. Uh, God real. bless, and I'm out. <laughs> Wait Prepare a minute. Shoot, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we only have only one, two. and I got it. Too funny. So you know, we're talking about tithe here. We're talking about all the details behind this first, second tithe, and just this this concept of giving. This concept of being ready to take care of others that's what the tithe truly is at the end of the day this isn't a how much can i sacrifice it's how much can we make sure mm -hmm. everybody's taken care of you know this is a very much other centered commandment said so, but in jubilees here apparently the angel of presence one speaking on god's behalf is like hey i'm gonna really super duper drive this home it, i don't know in this short section it's written on the heavenly tablets it's ordained it's ordained forever it's there's no time limit it's ordained forever again it's also mm -hmm. on the heavenly tablets you're like okay 
or tables. We're, we're kind of not messing around. This one's pretty serious. This is a part of us taking care of the people, the poor, mm -hmm. the widows, the sojourners. This is us being a light to the nations. This is us really showing the world how it's done. This is one of those principles. If we don't get this right, everything kind of domino effects falls apart. And so he's like, I'm going to really, really drive this home. Now, what I thought was cool was, is it talks about the, um, that this is an ordinance written that it may be fulfilled year to year about the second tithe. I thought that was interesting because it kind of goes into a concept like Joe was saying with Passover, but even on a, on a larger scale, because when we get to um, Shavuot, it's talking about, you know, no more, uh, no more old grain. Now you can start eating the new grain. Mm -hmm. So when it says this is a year to year, it's like, Hey, this is good until the next year. And I think it's talking about the biblical calendar year of, Hey, you can, all this stuff is to get you through winter. All this stuff is to get you through the, the, the times of lack. Mm -hmm. But whenever the winter's over, when your storehouses are kind of cleaned up, don't eat this anymore. We have new stuff. You're supposed to have your new harvest, your new grain, your new oil, your new wine, your barley, your wheat, start eating that stuff. So don't, don't eat old stuff when you have new stuff. He's like, essentially God's like never in a scenario of get your 24, 25 years safe buckets of food, right? He's like, yeah. Hey, I gave you what you needed until the next year. And guess what? That's why we wave it. And we say, thank you for the harvest because guess, we didn't have to get this, but you gave us food again. Cause otherwise without this food that we're saying, thank you for, we didn't have any more food because you told us not to keep any more food. So they're coming around literally to all these new harvests and this new grain that, you know, when you read it, we're just kind of like, Oh yeah, new grain, whatever. He's like, no, 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 this was it. If the, if the grass didn't grow, if the barley didn't grow, we don't eat. So, you know, it really is a, is a, um, a concept that follows very much. So of the manna, you don't eat unless I feed you. And he's pretty much keeping that principle alive throughout the scripture. So, you know, sometimes I think we rely on our own means, our own ability to survive. And he's like, I didn't ask you to do that. I kind of told right. you just to eat what you eat when I gave it to you. And when I bring you some more food, then you eat that until mm -hmm. that runs out. Then I'll give you some more. Yep. So, you know, you're in a constant reliance on the father versus our world today. We're in a constant reliance on self. I, I, I definitely want to plug something in here on that and see what you guys take is on this. But, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people nowadays that are preparation minded. We'll just put it like that. Right. And I know at least for myself, that's something that my wife and I have gone back and forth on. And we've done a lot of praying about those types of things. Right. And where we feel the father has landed on this, uh, landed us on that issue is that, yes, we are to be preparing. Uh, but we've also been told that our preparation is not necessarily for us. So that that's kind of an interesting aspect of the whole prepping yeah. preparation type thing. Right. But I do feel like we are, we have, we have the, we are supposed to depend on him. We're not supposed to depend on us. So mm -hmm. I'm totally on that. Then we have a situation like Joseph, right? right? Mm -hmm. That was something that he knew to do because of what he was shown. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, well, we have things that we are shown that's soon coming. We don't know exactly how soon kind of thing. Right. We have yeah. ideas. But anyway, so I, I would say anyone dealing with those issues, I would say just don't make the decision as to what you need to be preparing for, if anything, based on your own logic and reason. Go or to fear. the father or fear, especially. Right. Correct. Yeah. Uh, just go to the Father in prayer on those things and let Him guide you as to what you should be doing specifically. Amen. So, well, I want to add a little plug too while we're at it. So, one of the things over the years, like for me and Vicky, we started growing a garden this year. And so, some of this, I feel like, it, I mean, also, it doesn't matter if you're living in an apartment or a home or wherever you are, um, you can grow enough food, believe it or not. There's ways to do it to sustain you and your family. Oh yeah. So for me, instead of stacking or storing up all of this 25 year food, why not learn to actually grow food mm -hmm. and be able to sustain yourself, harvest your seeds, learn how to do these things. I've why never, not? never been a planter, nothing, but right now I've got some beautiful plants out there. Uh, thank to some, thank you to some help, some people in the community that were showing me because they know how to plant. They know they're giving me advice. Uh, I've got watermelon, uh, tomatoes, or um, not zucchini. What's the other one? The uh, cucumbers. Cucumbers. Uh, I got 
all kinds of stuff growing that I've never grown before in my life. <laughs> I've got fruit trees that I've planted that I've literally put out in the front of my yard. And I'll be honest with you, I put them out there so that if we ever do get bad and God forbid, we do get to that place, you know, in life. But I wanted to actually put those fruit trees out from where people can see it from. So if you're hungry, come and eat. Don't take all the fruit, but if you're hungry, come and eat. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I plan on planting more trees and I plan on expanding my garden down the road because as much as it's okay to have that stuff set aside, you know, for a rainy day or something, whatever happens, we live in South Carolina. We get hurricanes. It's not a bad idea to have some food storage. That's all I'm going to say. All right. And right. some extra batteries and stuff like that. Just, you know, candles, whatever you need, generators. Because every now and then we do get rocked by one and it takes us out for a little bit. So there's nothing wrong with preparation. But I also think we need to learn how to quit being dependent on the grocery stores and, and Walmart and all these different places. I think we need to learn how to be like, you know what? It's not that hard. And I promise you this, if my, if all my watermelons come in or come in, I can't eat all of them. I'm going to be giving watermelons away. Yay. I, I bought I bought <laughs> too many plants of watermelons. I didn't know any better. I'm like, hey, man, you're going to have about 40 watermelons, bro. <laughs> you have more than 40. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've seen it. So I've got, you know, jalapenos. All kind of, you know, I got stuff. And and something else important too is just learn the the learn about the plants around you. Yes, there is such yeah. an abundance of what yeah. the Father has provided for us in nature. You yep. don't even have to plant. You plant for familiarity. There's right. plenty of food all around us. Yep, and we live out in the country, so I guarantee you, there's stuff growing around me that people say, "Oh, that's a weed." And what you don't realize, you, they may call it a weed, but it's one of the most uh, nutrient dis dense things growing on your property that you could put in the salad and eat it. Or mm -hmm. medicine. Or, or medicine, medicine, yeah. Or more, yeah, medicine, yeah. All right, boys, I got, I got to bring this up. Um, <laughs> this, this is cool. <laughs> so you got indigestion? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, check this out. Check this All out. Right. So in verse ten, it says. The tithe to eat before Yahuwah from year to year in the place where it is chosen that he that his name should dwell. And to this law, there is no limit of days forever, forever. So surface level, I think it's real easy for us to pull out of this to this law. There is no limit of days forever. Yes. And I think that's where most of us stop right now. There's some people that look at this as it's done away, da, 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 da. Then there are those of us that look at this and say, see, to this law, there is no limit of days forever. Well, what about it is forever? Every aspect of it is forever. Yes. Every part of it is forever. And this is the thing. Um, let me clear this out real quick. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, let's pick a different color. Let's go with pink. How about that? I love it. <laughs> In the place where it is chosen that his name should dwell. Yep. Okay. Now, but we can't, we don't have a temple. We don't, we, we don't have the ability to go over to Jerusalem. We don't have the ability to go to Bethel. We don't have the ability to get that. But, and to this law, there is no limit of days forever. So yep. either that means one, he picked a location and we better go there whether we want to or not. Right. Period. Or maybe there's something else. Romans 8.10 comes to mind. Christ is in you, but if Christ is in you through the body, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Philippians 2.13, God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And we could go on and on and on about those types of things. And we've been talking a little bit lately about where he puts his name mm -hmm. and how his name is his mark. And our body isn't the temple, but our body is a temple. Isn't that also where he places his name? Yep. Aren't we where he places his name? The name that we don't take in vain. It's an important name to take take on that name not mm -hmm. just not just take it as in use it but <laughs> take on his name mm -hmm. we don't do that in vain 
We don't make that of no account, right? Right. So in the place where it is chosen that his name should dwell. I mean, even even people who are baby, baby Christians that 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 think saying some saying a specific prayer is what's going to get you into heaven. Right. They ask Jesus, come live in my heart. The basic concept is still there. Mm -hmm. It's still there. Let this be a dwelling place. Let his name be on me. And because of that, I'm going to do this forever because this is the place where it is to happen. What say you boys? I say, um, I agree with that. And here's, here's the thing too. Um, and I'm glad you brought this up, Kyle. <clears throat> I wish, can we pull up 10 again real quick? Yep. I wish that this is how it was written in our, the, our modern day Torah. <laughs> yeah. Because a lot of people say, and even though it says in there that these things are ordained forever, and it kind of stops at forever. But I love the way it's written here in Jubilees. It says, from year to year in the place where it is chosen that his name should dwell. And to this law, there is no limit of days forever. No limits of statute, uh, or what's that word? No limits of statutes or something like that. Or, you know, we were using modern vernacular. And it says, his name should dwell in this law. There is no limit of days forever. And then it goes into saying, hey, by the way, this is written on the heavenly tables too. Just to, just so you know <laughs> that we mean business. You know what I mean? It's like, just so you know that this is recorded in heaven, that this is a forever thing. And I, I love the way that Jubilees really drives that point home when it when it's speaking about these. You know, and here's when you're talking about where God chooses to place his name, I believe in all my heart that God has chosen to place his name over divine. And I believe that God has chosen not just divine, but uh, other places throughout the entire world. God has chosen to place his name there on those specific places. And we do know that when the new Jerusalem comes back, that when God's literally his name will be there, he will be there in Jerusalem, in the new Jerusalem, and that the nations will have to come back during, it's funny, in Revelation, I think it says during Sukkot. Yeah, three times a year still. Yep. So you still got to come here. By the way, this is where I abide in the physical now. So you're going to, this is exactly where you need to come to. Yep. You know, so, um, I think it's really cool though. This is where, where, wherever I place my name. And here's the other point I want to make with that. That I was thinking earlier was what I was sharing with you guys earlier about how we need to be able to hear God, listen to God, be able to know when God's telling you to move, stop, whatever it is, you know, the journey that you're on with our heavenly father. This was important, too, because you really need to know where was God placing his name. Because back then, it's like, hey, we're all going to Sukkot. There's a specific place that God says, my name is here. It's not over there. It's not over there, but it's here. And so for me, I'm reading this, I was like, this is very specific. It says, wherever I place my name, you need to understand and be aware of where it is I place my name. Because at this point, there is no tabernacle at this point. There is no temple at this point. There is no set place for this to take place. So God's like saying, hey, by the way, wherever I place my name, just know that's where you need to be at. All right, just to drive this home, let me um, let me read this. And it's kind of lengthy, but forgive me. Um, I think this is I think this speaks a lot to what we're talking about here. First uh, John four. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to determine if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you know the spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses that Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit who does not confess Yeshua is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. You have heard that he is coming and he is already in the world now. You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, what they say is from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Anyone who knows God's, God listens to us. Anyone who is not from God does not listen to us. From this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception know both of them dear friends let us love one another because love is from god and everyone who loves has been born of god and knows god the one who does not love does not know god because god is love 
God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love cons uh, consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the appropriation for our sins. Propitiation for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we must also love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given assurance to us from his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the father has sent his son, the world's savior. Whoever confessed that Yeshua is the son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. In this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, for we are as he is in this world. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear, because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. And just because there's only a couple more, might as well. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother, he has seen, uh, he has seen, he cannot love the God he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother. So we can go through plenty of New Testament and Old Testament referencing this. Um, I think that drives it home pretty well. What do we do without a temple? We do what the scriptures tell us to do. Amen. Forever. Yep. There is no limit of days. Who cares if we have a physical temple? It's not relevant. It's not needed. Not right now. <laughs> There'll be a time for that. But the oh, next yeah. one, ooh, you better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, Kyle, thank you for reading that. You know, it always goes back to the verse uh, Romans 10, 7, 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, the word of you know, Jesus. So I appreciate you from reading that because there's, there's a ton in there, right? I mean, if, if you guys go back and read first John, there's, it's kind of giving you some secrets that uh, help you to understand revelation a little bit better, help you understand some of the characters that show mm -hmm. up and uh -huh. where the names come from and why certain names get attached to certain groups. Uh, I'll just leave you with that super duper giant cliffhanger, but I love uh, the first, second John um, and reading them before Revelation or, re or even after. It's a really cool, uh, cool uh, alternative. I didn't expect those to line up so well together, um, but it's the same author. So it makes sense. But yeah, what, what, what we're talking about here is ultimately where God puts his name. And, and you guys probably hit it out of the park. It's a car in the parking lot's going off right now because the baseball's <laughs> through the windshield. But, you know, when, when we look at that, we're, we're called the body. We are, when you, when you look at what church is, when you look at the definition of church from the New Testament, the, in the sure. Greek, the ecclesia, it means the people. It means the body. It's never about the church. It's never about the building. It's never about the steeple with all the people, right? And, and Joe, to your point, you know, it says, well, God's placed his name at the vine or here or here or here. The reason that is is because of the people who are in that building, mm -hmm. the people who are there yep. doing the stuff. It's never... Hey, you put a sign up that says Church of God, and then God's like, oh, well, it's, apparently this is my church. I'm going to show up. Well, that's not how that works. It's the church because of the people who are inside of it, the people who have his name, the people who represent him to the world. Man. You know, when we when we go out, we are salt and light. Salt is part of the covenant. Light is a part of what God is. He says, in the, when, when Yeshua talks, he says, for I'm in the light. Be in the light, for I am in the light, because I am light. You know, so we, we have to have this understanding that, we don't go out into the world and we're just some random people. We're, you know, we're just the lowly, well, I'm, I'm saved. Well, I believe in the Bible, but I'm just one person. He's like, no, you're not just one person. You're a very important member of the body with my whole name attached to you. When people see you, they should see me. Just like when Yeshua was walking in the earth, he says, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. He said, he's, my, his name is all over me. When he comes back later, he's like, man, he's, he's even going to give me another name. It's going to be on my thigh. It's going to be great. It's, it's mm -hmm. gonna be, I'm going to get the upgrade name. I don't know what that is yet, but it's going to be cool, and it's still going to represent the Father, right? So we get to be regular small people 
in this huge giant body and this huge giant experiment experience of, of the mortal flesh and, and show the world that we belong to him, that his name is all over us, that we're part of the bigger body, that we actually matter in God's kingdom, that we're going to one day live forever in that kingdom as a kingdom of priests. Right. And so there's this huge important factor that, you know, we all need to drive home. We all need to understand that where, where he places his name, that's where he's going to be, where he chooses to dwell. Kyle, you killed it. He's, 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 he's here. He's dwelling amongst us. He says, two or more of you together, I'm, I'm there. This is your confirmation that I'm there. He's like, hey, by yourself, I'm still there. But mm -hmm. you're two people together, you know, little Jesus and John the Baptist situation. Hey, I, I, you know that I'm there, right? And so sometimes we, we forget those little details. We forget those facts. But stay connected, stay gathered, find yourselves, uh, you know, to study the scriptures, to find yourself approved. Let God's name be all over you. When you walk out in the world, know that you represent him and never, never, never take that name in vain. Woo. And with that, guys, we will see you next time for part two of chapter 32 in the book of Jubilees. God bless. Shalom. Ciao.